Okay, so we're getting into our panel of Georgia's future, shaping our state together. And we have Britain, Tampa, and Miss Eva. I will allow you to introduce yourselves or tell you a bit about yourself in fact. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I am Representative Ingo Willis. I'm an Atlanta native, born and raised in Southwest Atlanta. The graduates from Howard University in Washington, D.C. I uh, just landed from Chicago of the DNC. I am going into my second term as a state legislator. I spent 20 years professionally in the music business, actually, uh, as a publisher, a songwriter, and, and a copyright owner. Pivoted into the political space. I serve on the Small Business Committee and the Agriculture Committee for the state of Georgia, and I am honored to be before you today. All right, everybody, before we get to Ms. Pamela, y'all look good. You look good, but don't be rude. So, have some excitement and enthusiasm for all of our parents. They are very well accomplished and decorated, and we want to show them love, okay? With words, with words, with attitude. Okay, thank you. Okay, Ms. Pamela. What's up, ATL? I'm Pamela Lynn. I am an AT alien, gravy baby, all the things. Yes. Um, I took to spell college. Oh, gravy. Awesome, Harvard. Um, I am here today as founder of Restore Her US America. We are a nonprofit policy advocacy organization. We advocate on behalf of directly impacted women, of which I am one. Um, but you'll hear more about as we get started with the camera. Um, and my organization and I have been able to do some great things in Georgia. Although this is the South, understand we do win in the South. And I'm an example of that. And we're going to talk about the things that I've been able to win when we get started with the panel. But I'm happy to be here in my own state. All y'all can not from here. Welcome to the panel. Welcome to the panel. I'm Bobby. Good afternoon, in advanced class. My name is Brittany Smith, and as a, a true fellow Southerner, I will receive that welcome in the spirit of the Um Brittany Smith, Senior Director for uh, Federal Organizing and Reform Alliance. Um, happy to be working in this space of criminal justice reform. I've been in this space for about seven years after a career on Capitol Hill. Um, and into this issue advocacy for issues that affect so many individuals in our community, so many people that we know, uh, fall victim to this trap door. Uh, and this revolving door uh, back into, uh, into our facilities. So again, I'm, I'm happy to share more information with you all, talk about opportunities and, and the pathways that we are actually making uh, here in the state of Georgia uh, for so many individuals in Birmingham. Thank you, thank you. And you never know who when some information here could be helpful to you or someone in your family. I was the person that needed the services that reform offers, needed the policy and the law that they're putting into effect and fighting for, because I once went to jail, was on probation for five years, couldn't move out of the state of Georgia, and I was fighting a system that wasn't designed to help me succeed. So I needed someone to advocate for me and on my behalf. So understand what they're saying today, you may not need right this moment, but you may need later down the line. You might know somebody that will need it in the future. So what they're saying is very important. Please accept, please give them the respect, respect they deserve. So we will delve into the progress made, the current landscape, and the exciting prospects ahead. We will also explore the critical role of supervision reform and uncover some surprising aspects of the issue. Thank you. To all candidates, given reform's work and advocacy for criminal justice, Reform. What are some of the significant milestones that have been achieved here in Georgia recently? Um, so, first thing, we were happy to work with uh, Ben, who is part of our uh, coalition here in the state, in passing SP 105, and that was through the 2021 2022 legislative season. And that piece of legislation focuses on early termination for probation. As you heard Gail and her story say, she was sentenced to probation for five years. It was Georgia's commissioner, Michael Leo, who I heard say firsthand, 
if you're on probation more than two years, it's not working. It's supposed to be a system that's designed to help you ease back in to society. And if you're still on there after three years, four years, there's, 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 there's something wrong. And so what we looked at was ways that we can put policies in place that credit you for the accomplishments that you make. So again, since things like you're coming out of the facilities and you strive toward an educational degree, you obtain a career, and we career milestones, you enroll in and work in certain career programs. Those should count toward knocking time off of your probation because the objective is to get me home, to get me successful, so I don't return. And so as you accomplish these things, we feel, and it makes logical sense, that you should be excited about moving and these milestones in your professional career, in your personal career, in your family life. And it was through the help of the steward and the great work of the legislature, might I say, that that was a piece of legislation that passed with only two names in the entire house and zero names in the entire city. So that's an issue that we see on the right and the left and needed to be addressed. Thank you for that insight. Uh, and for those that don't know, SB means Senate bill and HB means House bill. So you have House and you have Senate. So just for context, you can have a great legislative idea, uh, but without bipartisan support, meaning people on both sides of the aisle, the Republican and Democrat, this is Georgia, okay? So we have the Republican-led House and Senate, right? I'm a Democrat, but when, you come, when it comes down to pushing an idea forward, you need bipartisan to support. So to your point, what made that effort successful is that it doesn't just apply to the black community. It doesn't just apply to the Latino community. It doesn't just apply to the white community. So there's common ground in the injury. And I found in my limited time in the legislature where you can find issues that resonate across communities, you have a better chance of pushing it forward. A lot of people in our community want to hear our name on everything. I want to say reparations, and, I, and, I get, and I'm with it, but when we're trying to move the issue forward, we can find something that impacts other communities, such as you can take someone from any culture, they have a family member, they have a family member or friend that aspires to re-enter society because no one is without wish. No one. And so I applaud the efforts that you all have made uh, and, and wanted to add to that, that coalition building in this policy. Yeah. Policy is progress. So for someone like me that is a, a legislator in the House of Representatives, people always ask how, how it works. You need to get to know your representatives. You need to get to know your state senators, wherever you may live. And you should contact us and bring us legislative ideas in our off season. This is my off season right now. I go back into session in January. So I'm looking through all of the policy ideas that people like you have brought saying, hey, I'm struggling with this, I got small business, we want this, we want that. Then we can go into our legislative session with the game plan. If we're in session, it's too late. If you're reading this, it's too late. I got to fight, I, I got to fight too many battles, but with something that's thoughtful, concise, has support and metrics. Numbers, the, the, the percentage of people who succeed and they have greater opportunities, then we are able to communicate across the aisle how he fights all of us. Because none of us who are here, all of us who are here are privileged. Sure. And there are people in our orbit who need us to assist them. Because once you can assist a family member or someone in your orbit with re-entry, it lifts the load of the family and it propels the generation forward. So I just wanted to speak on the connectivity between the policy, progress, support, alliances, organizations that actually get in the mud and the water, and then they come and say, hey, Brett Willis, I want you to carry this bill, or we might be people, we both on the land. It gets more beneficial, I say, hey, let's get this Republican over here to carry this bill, because it's got a greater chance to go forward. It's not about what my name is on, it's not about what I co-sign it, it's about the outcome. So that requires selfless leadership, but also the elimination of ego as we face real life.
So I'm going to rewind and repeat what Craig said, because I don't think y'all understood what he said when we got done. We passed SB 105, which means if you are in Georgia and you are on probation, if you are sentenced to 20, 30, however many years on probation, you can terminate your probation in three years. Right. Three years. Then I can make some best. I was on probation scheduled for five years, and they said, good behavior, you can be off at three. And I was a college student, paying tuition, well, not tuition, I had both, but <laughs> paying, paying more than board, paying for meals. So to pay for probation for five years, those add up. You're paying monthly. You're having to check in monthly. Or something that I didn't do. Right. And it's, it's, it's so many people who, who in here has been arrested? Who in here has been, who in here has been stopped by the police? Whether it's a chance to get So we all have the opportunities where we could be someone that needs their help. We can still make it. And again, this is Georgia. So I want you to understand how important this legislation was. Because Georgia has the most people under personal control in the entire world. Not just in the country, but the world. So passing this legislation was very, very, and in the South, made it even more imperative that we were able to accomplish this feat. But not only did it provide an opportunity for Georgians to get out probation in three years, it also re-enfranchised Georgia. And if you don't understand what that means, that means in Georgia, if you are on paper, you have to complete your sentence. You can vote. Yes. Talk about that. Yes. Right. And on the day that this bill was signed into law, we had on that one day 56,000 people that were eligible to get off probation, which also made them eligible to vote again. Since we passed this bill in 2021, the number of people at that time that had felony convictions that were eligible to vote, eligible to vote and not registered was 80,000. Today, it's over 500,000 people. And this is an election year, a very important election year. So it's very important. That all of you out there that know anybody that was on probation or that's formerly incarcerated understand that they have their voting rights. They can vote. And if they have any questions about it, they need to check in with reform or with restore her. We can guarantee that you know that you're able to vote. Because 500,000 people with felony convictions in Georgia that are eligible to vote and not register. We have the power to shape what Georgia looks like. We can run Georgia. This our state. And we can have the say in what happens in this state. So it's, it's a very important thing. Thank you, my sister. And to that point, the numbers that she just gave you, I, I just want everybody to sometimes they see out of reach. So when you hear the reports, that Georgia is in play in November, the numbers that she just mentioned actually will help us push Georgia blue. Why does that matter? These policies are coming from individuals who care about us and look like us, regardless of who pushes it or who carries the bill. So when you hear about re-entry programs, when you hear about programs that allow you to become, when you want a better life for yourself, the opportunity is there for you to live that life. And, and when those individuals take those steps, they should be allowed to participate in all the processes. This November, we have an opportunity to not only make her student history, we have an opportunity to shift the paradigm of criminal justice in the state of Georgia. Yes. So this is not a time to sit on the sidelines, my brothers and sisters. This is a time to get in the game because if you're not at the table, you want the menu. Yes. So you either want to be a part of pushing us forward or we are on the menu, and if you haven't heard Project 2025, we're on the menu. It's a 900 plus page document within which dissolves the Department of Education, dissolves the Department of Education. I'm sorry. 
amongst other things. So I want you all to take this as seriously as we do, but not feel that your 10 steps were moved from us. We're right here. Let us know, hey, I, I need to know if I got my vote rights back. I, I thought I didn't have it. Well, are you all paper? We, we, we are here to say that because you can vote, we need that. And the deadlines are here. now that they're all papers, do they have to re register? No, Do they? So, one of the things that Georgia does to oppress our voters is we have this purge system. Yes. So, if you have not voted, yes. Fluently, yes, you would need to check to make sure that it is still registered. Thank you. Well, what challenges do you feel still remain and you envision reform fatigue involvement in state of Georgia's age? I one for me that I feel when it comes to voting, I know there's three states where you can still vote even if you are in jail. Washington is one of them. Of course they want people to watch to get vote. But a southern state, or the very black state. Yeah. Yeah, I thought you had to be off of me. No. If you're incarcerated, you're currently sitting in jail, you haven't been convicted of a felony, you don't have a felony conviction, you haven't been convicted of a felony, you can vote in jail. You can. Despite the voting rights act, the voting rights act is not going to be restored. That's important to know that the voting rights are automatically that your voting rights are automatically restored because nobody that has to tell you. nobody has to tell you. You don't have to go back to the courthouse again because there are certain little things that are instituted in policy that incite trauma. And so, for instance, then the last time I was at this courthouse, y'all keep taking me away in handcuffs. I saw my mama crying. I don't want to come back. I just want to stay away. I'm not coming back. I don't want to do this anymore. So to tell me in order to get my vote right back, I have to come right back down here and you fill out all these paper. And when y'all do it, I think it. I don't want it. So the, there are several states where you still have to do that. Or it takes the, the governor's signature. Georgia's not one. So you already have that once the vote right is restored. Uh, once the supervision ends. So what challenges are there? And another important thing that y'all need to know. The judges, the prosecutors, the sheriffs. These people that make the decisions to take your loved ones away and lock them up for all these years and treat them like shit while they're locked up, they are voted on. They do not put out an application and interview for their job. We vote them in those positions. So that's another reason why it's very critical that you register and you vote because you have control over those who those judges are who those prosecutors are, and who those sheriffs are. You can have that power to say who you want in those seats. So that's also why it's very important to vote. Ms. Pam, as the founder of Restore Her, you advocate for women in prison. Yes. Do you have a personal story that you want to share with us? Sure. Of your experience of what the most pressing issues that women are facing in prison and in the criminal justice system, how we can address it at a state. A bad business decision of my first business cost me 78 month federal sentence. During that time, I found out I was pregnant. I was shackled while I was pregnant, which caused me to fall and miscarried my baby. My miscarriage looked like me being shackled to a bed while I was miscarrying with two male officers between my legs that refused to give me any privacy. And then they threw my baby in the trash. And to add injury to insult, they placed me in solitary confinement for eight months directly after this happened to you. That's just some of the injustices that women occur, <clears throat> have to overcome during incarceration. There are so many gender inequities for women that are incarcerated because the prisons are built for men. They don't expect to have women and women have to adhere <clears throat> to all of these regulations created for men, including what we wear. They wear men's clothes. Everything is based on the men. And so because of that, when I came home and I was told there was nothing I could do about what happened to me, I, start, I found it my organization was so up. And for me, the most impactful way to show that there was something that that could be done was to change the law, which is how I got involved with policy. And the first law that we changed here in Georgia is HB 345, which bans shackling, solitary confinement, squadron coughing, 
Thank you, so to all of that. But it's possible to put me in. And then we got that to pass that bill with 23 states across the country. Yeah. So I, I just want to highlight, even as as we talk about the first thing we do was get back to uh, Addison passing the law, and I work with with the past years, and each time she tells that story, it's never lost on me. And I would actually say the first thing we did was tell her story, so that lawmakers heard these stories, so that people actually saw that these are realities that people are experiencing, that these aren't distant stories, that these aren't um, our, our, our fictitious or it didn't happen here, doesn't happen here. And the fact that you engaged and told your story, that's what we ask people to do. At Reform Alliance, we look and work with community people because there's so many stories that need to be told that will inspire transformation in legislation. And so we encourage you all, work with local organizations, talk to your family members so that they can get the help they need for the trauma, so that they can work with individuals who have similar lived experiences to be able to tell their stories to lawmakers and change makers alike. I think sometimes we're so far removed, right? We as black people look at one another and we're like, okay, they, they probably encounter the cops at some point in their lives. People who are not who are not black, they look at us and they they can fathom, right? With George Floyd happened, my rep, the manager, my agent, reached out to me and they're not black and they were apologetic and they wanted to check on me. And I've informed them that, hey, I've had a run in with the law before. I've had a moment where when I was on probation, when I went to jail, the lady pulled me, it was a case of wrong identity. I was in college, we were at Georgia Southern, which is a dry county, and um, they were called to the apartment complex for a, I guess somebody was like, so I'm at a friend's house, the police came. I was like, oh, we need to just leave. Because we as black people are taught to like, just, just go. Just make life easy on yourself. Now, I wasn't where the bike was, but it was a, an apartment complex. I was walking back to my car. They cut me off, they cut off my friends. And like, I also was visiting here from the Austin State. So I think I left my life in the Austin. I was like, let's just leave. I told my own car to drive. I try to get in the car there. I can get busy questions for us. I just get the car. I was like, I'm going to be able to chill. I'm just thinking. I get the car. She pulls my arm out, opens the door, and slams the car door on my car. It was in a charger at the top of the other head. And it was a whole situation. And I think when I told my wretches, they were so baffled. Like, how? You're successful. You're calm. And I'm like, I'm glad. Like, that's, that's the charge. That's, that's the section. That's the problem. So, we as black people, we can a face so much simply for being black. Simply, and I'm pretty sure that yes, women face a lot of things in prison, and a lot of things being stopped or arrested, but it's much more worse on us together. And people don't understand, we need to come together and listen to families, get this past speaks our representatives so that he knows what they that we encounter so they can put us in five people and it's not like showing off like a like a zoo or something but it's to let you know that I too have experienced this. I too have experienced injustice. Now state representative how was your experience as an elected official includes your view of criminal justice reform? Like what are some legislators or key legislative initiatives that you supported or opposed and why? Thank you for the question. Um, so in the legislature, because we are a minority party at this time, although, so a few things I want you to know. Our, our end game goal is to, to take back the majority. We used to be a majority. When you're in the majority, as with anything in your lives, you, you have the control, you have the vote. So number one, our objective is to flip seats. Okay? Um, that's something that's important to me because without that, it makes it all the more difficult to pass legislation. So half of our strategy while we're in that process is we may not be able to pass a bunch of legislation that we want, but we can stop plenty of bad bills. And so stopping bad legislation is a win as well. What that has taught me is you may think you have identified what progress looks like. I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna launch my business, I'm gonna run it like this. And then life happens if you're like, wait, if I'm out, 
Maybe they are happy doing something different. Or maybe you can stop something bad from happening. And that's a lot of what we do. So things that I've seen thus far are, and, and I'll be honest with you, um, the Republican Party has been hijacked by, by Manny, right? And so a lot of the legislation that we've been able to stop and we see coming down the pipe, they want to bring back three strikes. They want to increase penalties for particular crimes. They want to continue to overfuel the prison pipeline with us. And to your earlier point, anything that impacts our community, impacts our women, even worse. It, 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 it does. So, so, so our issues are connected. And I think that's the key because we are being driven to be separate. That's man and woman, which is a farce and a strategy. And you got to recognize when gay is being run on you. And gay is being run on you when it makes you think like, I'll be you, you know, yes, I do. I absolutely do. And guess what? You can do it too. Okay? And if I can have my parents can have 50 10 meetings. All right? And I'm, I'm, I'm being honest with you. My father's 97 years old and well. You want to know why? Because it's well taken care of. So, point B, if, 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 if we are able to tell our stories, not be victimized permanently by what has happened to us, but be able to shift our pain and to prophecy and progress, and that's what we have to do with one another, and that's what pushes policy. And as we approach this moment, that is imperative. And you will see strategy, no one gains being run on you. And you're gonna see it when it when it separates you from me. You need this. I don't need it. I do. It's divisive. Okay, so when you hear about reentry programs, I'm a parent in the state of California from the Thomas General or the state of Georgia. Recognize that policy assists our community with becoming better and moving forward. So things that are important to me are healthcare. All of it's connected. Not just healthcare, healthcare for incarcerated men and women. They should have, you should have dignity in incarceration. And, and because it is not mandatory to subjugate someone to kill you might environment that is an extension that is an extension of slavery and so if you don't feel connected to the solution we need to solve the problems we need more than three of us we need all of y'all so i pay attention to the connectivity of education you should be able to get an education in incarceration right you should be able to get health care in incarceration you should also be able to come out better than you went in, not worse. If you come out worse mentally, physically, and spiritually, then you went in, then how do you expect it to succeed? Then we're starting from behind. So that, that is all connected to me. So short answer, I look for the interconnectivity of the issues. You may think healthcare doesn't matter to you. Yes, it does. You may think health insurance not with you. Yes, it is. We will get sick. And I'm saying that as a, as a recent for us to do well while in session. Okay, it matters, and so if it matters to me, and I don't have access to health care resources, got some good insurance through the state because I'm a state legislator. What about the system that's incarcerated? It's born through what I work with that doesn't have access to that's who I fight for. And as, as, a, as a representative, I don't do what I want to do, I have to represent my constituents, and I vote based upon what they want me to do. I ask them, they tell me, and that's who I go represent. Even if it doesn't agree with what I want. That's my job. That's what you're elected to do. We thank you. We thank you for your five years of victory. So I'll call your question yourself. Right, and that's what we get five Okay, now, this location reform is a critical aspect in criminal justice reform. What are some of the hidden facets of supervision that people may not be aware of? And how can we use the current effectiveness of supervision while ensuring fairness and equity for all. Uh, this is like, you no. um, So, one of the things that we, uh, as a forum, focus on uh, are combating technical violations. Technical violations uh, are literally just what that sounds. The technicalities of of the terms of your parole and probation. Uh, I'll give you a very unfortunate story. Uh, we have a gentleman who was on probation, uh, was, in, of course, the terms of probation were, you cannot come in contact with law enforcement. 
Yeah. Like, he was driving his car, stopped at the stop sign, boom, got hit, and the car sped up. So he was involved in the hit and run. Well, he calls his insurance company and says, Yeah, give me the police report just so you can get your insurance card. Calls the police, gets the police report. Two days later, he gets a call from his probation office and says, Hey, your name came up in the sky. And he says, Yeah, I was involved in the hit and run. I said, Well, that was an unauthorized contact with law enforcement and I have to violate that To the letter of the law, that's what it said. So that technical violation sentenced him to two more months in jail because he was a victim of a hit and run and had to have contact with law enforcement. It's, it's, it's those types of things, these technical violations, these, these hidden nuances where Actors don't use good don't use their discretion for good. And so what we have to do is combat that with sound policy to make sure we're living in some of these technical violations. Um, unfortunately, there are so many people in our community that we know who struggle with substance abuse. And unfortunately, there's so many kids that we see uh, we usually champion at least graduated sanctions, if nothing else, but we want to see people struggle with their substance abuse met with healthcare professionals, not punitive measures. You know, because these are people who are struggling with addiction and they really need some actual medical assistance as opposed to law enforcement and correction. So again, those technical violations, those nuances within those policies that are just cycling so many people in and out of these facilities, in and out of these prisons, in and out of these jails, and in Georgia, because so many of your supervisions, is, well, all your supervisions are autonomous, which means each county runs their own supervision. So I could be in, I could be on probation in Cobb and on parole in Grenada, and then get off of probation, but not remember, I pay probation here, pay parole here, I got a check in there, I could get off of two years here. I mean, you can qualify for other time actually. So again, because, and the systems don't talk to each other. So it doesn't count, like they don't aggregate it and, and make sure everything is accounted for. So these things, and next thing you know, you think you're doing good, you're paying, you're going, you're checking in, and next thing you know, you've missed probation because you were making it wrong. So nuances like that, and hitting you with that, are, are, are what really just drives the forward to keep doing the right thing. I have a question. So, Georgia is an open carry state, mm -hmm. all right? So, some of everybody has a gun. I myself, I ain't seen that. If there is someone around who is on probation or parole, they can't be around guns. <laughs> but if they if they come over my house, they pick up, or if I have, if I was a good driver and I had a gun in my car and we get stopped, they go back to jail, correct? Yes. Because they are around it, even though it's it's not it's an extension mm -hmm. and they don't it's they don't know that like, it's around white. That's happened about Yes. Because you your responsibility, you know, and then yeah. you know, those couple of things that bring me to those are not even the only who I see. Mm -hmm. They can write in special conditions of uh, your probation. For example, when I was on supervised release, I could not use my credit, I couldn't take loans. I can not spend more than five hundred dollars at one time, and I have been gone six and a half years. How am I supposed to get reestablished if I couldn't even access my personal, you know, information? Um, also, here in Georgia, we have probation and parole. We like to put people on parole for so long, and then after you finish the parole, then we go to probation. And so a lot of people can't even take advantage of SB 105 because they have so many years on parole before they can even make it to probation, which is another issue. And being on parole, when you have the opportunity for a hearing, you don't even physically get to speak to a person so they can see the report of whatever changes that you made within yourself. Everything is on it. You put whatever you want them to see in a file. They look at a file. Nobody talks to you. They don't have to speak to you. And so, how can you really assess where a person is 
when you're trying to determine, you know, if you want, if they're eligible for parole, if you're not even speaking to that person, but just looking at some paperwork and looking at the file. So how do we keep supervision effective, but ensure that it has fairness and equality? Uh, I'm tapping in and I'm passing back to my colleagues. Um, I think it's extremely important, even, even in this very moment, to go one day. I, I'm a law maker now, right? I understand that the system is flawed. It is very comfortable in it is to yeah. be around what you are. We know the system is fragmented. We know the system is broken. We know that there are gaps within probation and the law. We, we know all of those things. We have to shift into operating in a space of solutions. So when you recognize a gap based upon your personal experience, like, hey, I have, you know, in my car, I was an Uber driver, and someone got, you know, you tell the story to a law or to an advocate. It's like, you know what? We should amend. We should amend this law that exists and make this particular thing exempt. Now, then I'll come to someone and say, look at the data points. Cross, cross screening. How many Caucasian individuals are impacted by this? How, you know, get the data points and then we're able to say, hey, this has affected everybody. We should amend this. That's how you effectuate change. You effectuate change by communicating your stories, right? Having people elected that listen and then sitting down and say, this is what we can do. Now, we may fix the system. Go back to say that other part of the thing. Which one? The location is the big day. Let's go back to that one. Yeah, okay. So, that's what we can do. Yes. Having elected officials who listen. If they don't, you vote them out. But you can't vote them out if you don't vote. And you can't vote if you don't register. And you can't, you, you can't pre register if you don't know that you got voting rights reinstated. And, and we live in a time where people come to us at the Capitol and say, well, nobody, nobody told me. Ah, who's that going to information? I grew up on this like the previous. You have to go, and that man, that man way middle class with your mom and daddy had this like the on the bookshelf. World book, it was a big deal, but now it's writing the phone. So it's like, we don't, we're not even taking collectively enough steps to identify, to say, hey, I'm self advocating. That's where you start. I read this, this isn't right. This right was violated. Am I right or wrong on this? Okay, am I, okay. is there anything that I can do? Because I got two brothers and you, you know, like we need your help as stakeholders in policy improvement. We can't do it by ourselves. And if your public servants are not serving you well, sure. I give you two options. Vote them out or run for office. I ran for office. What are you going to do? I will start it. Well, can't be anywhere. The starter can't be everywhere. Our state rep can't be everywhere. So we as a community have to do it. It's a collective. It's a collective process. We all have to work towards Georgia's progress. 